traffic engineering is is 90% psychology and 10% engineering. The engineering is easy. It's there's standards, there's guidelines. Everybody you can buy or you can call a contractor and say Re repave this road for me and they'll do it because they've done a hundred of them before no problem at all. But the 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 tricky bit is trying to get the psychology to work. So drivers don't drive too fast. So drivers don't uh, try and hit bikes on their way, you know, you take that aggression out, take that focus on the other. Like you said, I think that's a really nice way to put it. As soon as there's other people involved, we get annoyed. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's just a strange human, <laughs> human nature um, thing. But that, that means that you have to design a traffic system that works with that and not against that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns channel and this episode of the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this journey to better understand what it takes to create people-oriented places that promote active living naturally. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Thursday, January 6, 2022, our first episode of the year and number 104 in the series. And it features a fascinating conversation I recently had with Leonard Hout, manager of international strategy at Mobicon, a mobility systems design firm based in the Netherlands. We discussed the exportation and implementation of sustainable safety concepts for mobility networks to other cities around the world and we get into some specific infrastructure design details. But before we roll into those discussions, please allow me a brief moment to simply say thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in, subscribing to the Active Towns channel, smashing that like button, commenting, sharing, donating, and or becoming a patron through my Patreon page. My mission with this effort is to grow a movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities around the world and inspire the transformation of neighborhoods, communities, cities, states or provinces, and yes, even countries. And I simply cannot do this without all of you, so I'm incredibly grateful that y'all are here. Okay, okay, let's get this conversation with Leonard rolling. It is absolutely my pleasure to welcome uh, into the Active Towns podcast here in 2022, Leonard, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And as you'll notice on the scroll here, we, uh, we've, we, we have your uh, sort of adopted uh, nickname of Big Rock, and, and that's courtesy of uh, our good friend, uh, the American Feetster and uh, Br uh, Brandon Lust. And he's a past uh, um, a guest on the podcast. And, and this is where you got that uh, <laughs> a nickname from. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that nickname before we dive into more of a, a formal introduction of you? Yeah, yeah, that, that nickname came about, I think it was from the Traffic Coming webinar. Um, and the big rock doesn't necessarily have anything to do with me personally, but it is my my personal um, belief that traffic calming or managing traffic flows in, in towns and cities, people always think it's expensive and complicated and oh, how do we technically solve this or how do we do it? But, but the engineering part is super easy and can be very cheap. Uh, you can do really serious, excellent traffic calming by just putting a giant rock in the middle of the street. And all of a sudden you'll see that cars travel way, way slower, way more carefully, and, and you manage the, the, the numbers of cars on your streets as well. So it doesn't have to be expensive. It's politically expensive, but financially pff, cheap. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I've seen some very creative and fun uses of decorative big rocks that have been used uh, in various situations, you know, for, mm. from a traffic calming perspective. So with that, that was a nice uh, homage to uh, my good friend, uh, Brandon. Let's, uh, let's kind of shift over and, and have you tell the, the audience a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, how you became passionate uh, yeah. about this field of study. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was born and raised in the Netherlands and I lived here until I was uh, 24. Four, I think. Um, and I studied uh, civil engineering first, where I thought I wanted to be a bridge designer. Um, and then I decided that, no, I don't want to be the guy who designs the bridge. I want to be the guy who tells other people where the bridge goes. So I obviously went into uh, town planning. Um, and there I studied for four years in the city of Groningen. Uh, and during my studies, the word bicycle didn't really 
the surface, even though it's the city with the highest bicycle mode share in, in the world, I think even. Um, and that was really, yeah, it wasn't really on my radar at all. Um, but what happened is I, I moved in my undergrad to uh, New Zealand, where I studied for six months and really loved it, loved the city uh, where I studied, um, really enjoyed the experience, um, met my my now uh, a partner there, moved back after I finished my master's. And I, I when I was living there, I just felt that something was missing out of the equation. Um, I found myself walking very long distances to the supermarket or uh, driving to a large mall, which was, you know, had a novelty factor at first because it's not something we have a lot of here in the Netherlands. Uh, but that novelty wore off pretty quickly. And I just realized that there was that, that medium distance that was just too long to walk uh, and too short to drive or too, too cumbersome to drive. And there was no real alternative because I, I didn't really feel safe riding my bike uh, around the city. It's pretty, uh, well, very car oriented, even in the, in the residential neighborhoods. Um, so that's when I when I started yeah, thinking more about why this was, why this was, why how it was. Um, and then I got my first real job at an engineering firm because they, they basically hired me because they're like, oh, you're Dutch, uh, you're a planner, you must know how wide a bicycle lane is. And I was like, well, I, I can figure it out. It's not can't be too hard. Um, and from there, I started designing uh, little safety improvements, little tinkering with some some schemes, and that grew into more substantial projects with network planning, bike ra- bikeway design, separated bikeways to start investing in. And that's how I slowly rolled into the, the world of, of bicycle planning, really, uh, with my next job being more uh, strategic and network planning, also still some design aspects, but um, slowly trying to make my way through the decision-making tree, understanding how a city operates the way it operates and why it's so hard to to ride your bike in some cities. Um, so that, that I spent five years in New Zealand, um, and that's when I really yeah, wanted to get to the bottom of it and really understand how that works. Um, yeah, and then I moved back to the Netherlands uh, and got a job in Mobicon as a manager of international strategy. So doing basically the same work, but now from a Dutch base, uh, working internationally on, on the same types of projects. Fantastic. Well, that makes a lot more sense now, uh, your your international orientation within the organization. And and Mobicon is 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 quickly becoming a presence here in North America with, with two separate offices. Uh, and I guess it, it it also makes a little bit more sense too in terms of the uh, the fact that your your seminal first real jobs you know out of graduate school and everything were you know right there in an international context. Yeah. So it, it, so you started yeah. to actually appreciate and see what was special about Dutch design and Dutch infrastructure and what you grew up in uh, from the eyes of, of of a different country. Yeah, so. yeah, it's really the the goldfish analogy, right? Once you're in the in the in the fishbowl, you don't really know what a fishbowl is or why why it's like that and why it can only swim in circles. Uh, but when you're out in a big ocean, you're like, hey, that fishbowl was kind of nice and safe. <laughs> um, how does that work? And how do I get back in? Um, yeah, that that analogy really worked uh, for me personally. Definitely, it's uh, it's it's launched my career in this in this world. Yeah, yeah. And how long have you been with uh, Mobicon now? Um, just over five years, five and a half years now. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, yeah. you've actually, you, you joined the firm at about the time that, that I would say, you know, things, you know, internationally, people have really tuned in with the Dutch mm-hmm. and with what's going on with the, the infrastructure there in the Netherlands, as well as in Copenhagen to a certain extent, um, really, turning to, you know, especially the Dutch, really turning to uh, them and saying, you know, help us, <laughs> bring us along. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and it, it's not to say that it wasn't happening before. Um, I think our very first Think Bike uh, workshop mm-hmm. that we had here in Austin, Texas was you know, a little over a decade ago. And so mm-hmm. now we're all actually seeing on the ground, you know, the, the, the results of some of those earlier effects. But I think it's really ramped up quite a bit in the last, yeah. you know, five, six years. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's my assessment. Is that, you know, sort of what you're seeing as well? Totally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's taken the Dutch quite a while to understand 
uh, that we were sitting on on gold and that other cities and, and countries really needed that knowledge that we had um, even though sometimes maybe we didn't know that we had it um, and that appetite for for um, external knowledge uh, not just in North America but globally I would say has has definitely increased significantly in the last well even in the last three years I think it's grown a lot when I just joined it was still, yeah, there was a, was a lot, a lot happening, but in the last two or three years, it's it's definitely exploded, which is great to see because it's uh, there's so much work to do, and so few people to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, I reached out to you, um, you know, a few weeks ago when we, after you had posted some some photos and and basically really. Um, sort of like dispelling the myth that, you know, these concepts, these Dutch philosophies and these Dutch engineering concepts, you know, they certainly can't be done outside of the mm. Netherlands. I mean, the Netherlands is very, very special, obviously, you know, it's very, yeah. very flat and, you know, it's very flat. Oh yeah, to totally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's a myth. And, and we have, we know that it's a myth because we, we actually have some wonderful, uh, you know, facilities here that we can turn to and, uh, let's pull this up because this is just yeah. one of the photos, uh, you know, that yeah. that really kind of you know addresses the fact that it can be done elsewhere. So tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, uh, well, obviously it's not very flat over there, and uh, that's the first thing I think we can notice. The the, the town. This is a town of Canmore in Alberta. A uh, big shout out to them because they are one of the pioneers uh, in this space, and they have been well. We've been working with them for a long time. Um, but this is their first uh, real large size protected intersection that they built. Uh, it, it finished earlier this year, so a few months ago. Um, and it's got basically all of the features that you would see in a, in a Dutch protected intersection uh, executed in an in a Alberta um, context. So it's not, not even a, a necessarily very, um, well, the usual suspect kind of town, you know, sometimes we think like, oh, the progressive little, or the progressive big cities, maybe New York can do it or whatever. No, this is a small town in Alberta, which is referred to as the Texas of Canada, uh, where there's giant trucks, there's a lot of snow, there's, uh, well, terrible weather parts of the year. It's a ski town in winter, it's a resort town in summer, uh, pretty high volumes of traffic, but they still um, through, well, the whole range of good strategy, good policy, and then, and then well, not to toot my own horn, but I think it's good design. And um, they did manage to implement a very innovative um, um, intersection that's still large. It, uh, it's still, you know, it's not a small intersection, but it works. Uh, and it's a it's a Dutch intersection at a Canadian scale, which is, I think, a fantastic example. And one of the projects that I'm definitely most proud of. Yeah, and, and as I'm scrolling through and looking at the, mm. the these photos, I'm I'm seeing something that looks rather familiar to me because um, here in the city of Austin, um, you know, they have also uh, adopted the the Dutch red <laughs> in in much good, of the, the bicycle network, <laughs> and so it's cool to see that. The, the only thing that that mm. just I, it pains me, and we have the same thing. Uh, here is that they have figured out how to do the Dutch red in the concrete, but when then it comes to the asphalt, it just stops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although in, um, that was also a design feature that actually matches uh, Dutch design guidance. If there's no bicycle priority, then the color changes. If bicycles do have priority, uh, if the lights are off or whatever, mm -hmm. um, then, then you would have red asphalt. So we, we actually designed it on purpose uh, this way, but I agree. Otherwise, the, yeah. at all the crossings, it is nice to have the continuous red. It, it does look beautiful. Yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> does, it does look beautiful when it's that way. Yeah. So, I mean... This has to bring you a fair amount of pride to be able to see this come to fruition in North America. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, and of course, it's, I'm I'm not the only one who's worked on this. This was a large uh, team effort, and and a big um, compliments to the, the the detailed design engineering firm as well, uh, whose name I accidentally forgot at the moment. Um, but they've done a good job in um, in, in transferring uh, the concept design to a, to a detailed and construction level because that's not a service that we as Mobicon do necessarily. Um, but this is this is the outcome of a long uh, process, right? This starts years ago where the city had a very progressive um, uh, transport plan um, created 
partially by my um, by my colleague Dick van Veen. He was uh, working with Mobicon at the time, and he he um, was working with the town for a while. And they figured out that okay, we need to change something fundamentally at the beginning of the process to be able to implement all these changes. Sort of quite an aggressive mode share target um, for for bikes and pedestrians, which means that they just make different decisions along the way, where they really think like okay, we do have to reduce car use a little bit in the in the town if we want to make space for all these other modes. And then they started to work on um, some street designs. So there's uh, some residential streets that look, I think, stunning um, with all the the, the red um, the red concrete as well. Uh, and this is one of the the the, the starting projects of a, a larger arterial road diet, basically. Um, that's one of the streets that runs off this this intersection um, where they want to reduce it from four lanes to two. Um, and this is the gateway to that. So, so they, they made some really fundamental changes in how they see their road network instead of just thinking, oh, where are the cars going to go and how do we accommodate them? They, they're taking a more proactive approach and saying, no, we don't want the cars to go this way. We want them to take another route uh, around the back into town. So we're going to actively squeeze some of the traffic out of here. And that's what you see now, right? The, the, the feedback uh, from some of the people is like, oh, we can't turn or it's really hard to turn left any, uh, because it's, you know, one lane less or what it's like we're talking you know a minute delay or something right, right um, yeah. but that's that's the purpose yeah um the purpose that they, they have a strategic goal they have a network that they actively try and push traffic in certain directions because the roads are better suited for it and i right, think that's right. a really valuable lesson that not a lot of cities have been able to push right. yet but it's yeah. necessary to get the right type of infrastructure in right yeah yeah absolutely yeah. that's great <laughs> So uh, the other the other fun thing that you sent uh, my way was was a video of uh, a, an intersection. So let's pull pull that up, and we can uh, we'll, we'll just let this play in the background, and you can talk a little bit about mm. what's going on here and, yeah. and and why you thought this would be a, a fun thing to you know sort of have you know as a, a little bit of our backdrop. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bit of a comparison, right? This is a, an intersection in the city of Tilburg in the Netherlands with a, a very comparative, comparable scale to the intersection that we saw in Canmore earlier. Mm -hmm. Multiple lanes on the approaches, quite large uh, intersection, long crossing distances. But what you see here is that that design actually corresponds quite nicely with with what we see in Canmore. And I, well, I just love drone footage. First of all, I mean, it, I think it looks great. It's very peaceful. I can watch this for hours on on, on a loop. I, I think you, <laughs> Unfortunately, I think you sent me like an hour and 13 long. <laughs> yeah. This is only 13 minutes, so you, you don't get the good. full hour. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so it's such a peaceful, uh, peaceful view from the top. It's very, uh, you, and you can really see how it operates. And I think some of the key features that, that make this intersection work so well is so nice to see uh, from a drone footage instead of just satellite imagery, because now you can actually see how people behave, where do people ride, how do people cross, who goes first, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, and that, that makes it uh, one of the videos that we now use in our, uh, in our trainings quite a lot, because it's, right. it's, it's just, yeah, you just sit there and watch it and be like, ah, oh, okay, so that car goes first and then ah, these people yeah. on the bikes that are approaching from the north they wait a little bit in front of the car where you see at the top right um so the car can see them all the elements that make a protected intersection so good you can see in, in this one beautiful ballet yeah, yeah <laughs> the ballet on there well speaking of, yeah. of ballet uh you and i had talked a little bit before we pressed record about the fact that uh i i'm a huge fan of the dutch style roundabouts and uh, and I know that that you recently did a webinar about uh, the roundabout designs and things of that nature. While this image is up, um, and, and then I'll, I'll I'll try to find a different uh, uh, something else to pull up so that we can you know kind of do a compare and contrast. Talk about what this would look like um, in an urban setting if this was a Dutch style roundabout. Mm. Mm. Yeah quite a bit smaller actually a lot of people think that roundabouts are huge um, but if you look closely at this you can see the three approach lanes from from uh, east and west direction and then three from the north two from the south or mm -hmm. three from the south as well i think so that's actually a lot of space um, and if you think about a roundabout you can turn left right or straight from the same lane mm -hmm. so all of that extra lane and um, space that we have on the approaches here just goes away which means that you you really need um yeah, a lot less space in, a, in an intersection section like this if you if you were to have it as a roundabout mm -hmm. 
Yeah, also, yeah. people hate stopping, right? Nobody likes to stop for a traffic light, especially if it's quiet, not a lot of traffic like in this situation. I would just be frustrated because what am I waiting for? There's nobody crossing. There's literally nothing, right, nothing right. dangerous going on. Why don't you just let me go? So you, you by building a roundabout, you, you kind of take that frustration away and you, you just let the, the, the traffic manage itself. There's no regulations or no light that somebody decided that's going to turn red you know i don't have anybody to blame but the rest of the traffic if i have to wait uh, for something and i think that that makes the whole intersection work very differently removes a lot of the frustrations um, and just makes the whole thing more fluid and more yeah like a ballet like you said i think it's a it's a really nice um nice way to talk about a roundabout because it's it's way more about um, contact with each other making eye contact giving way to each other when you can um, and it's yeah it's just a much more civil way of uh, of operating less regulatory and more personal and i think that's a that's a nice bonus of the roundabout next yeah. to all of the safety features that we have i mean roundabouts are safer better for everybody uh, a dutch roundabout <laughs> not an right. american roundabout yeah, yeah. no offense yeah. <laughs> We're still working on one of those. So this is an example. So this is an overhead here that that we're looking at. Um, and to your point, it, it it they don't take anywhere near as much space, real estate, as what North American context of mm. you know the modern roundabout where the prioritization is in the fast movement of motor vehicles versus uh, you can actually you know fit. A roundabout, you know, a Dutch styled roundabout where prioritization is is there for the more vulnerable users into a fairly tight space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, 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 there's a few things that you need to take into account that I think a lot of people forget. I won't go too much into technical details, but, you know, the size of the island and the, the, the setback of the bike lane, et cetera, et cetera. But especially yeah, in, the, in, a, in a North American context, I think a lot of North American roads or arterials are uh, way over designed for the traffic volumes they, they carry. So a 15,000 vehicle per day road can already have four or sometimes even six lanes at the at the intersection and then you're definitely easily you could easily fit in a, a continental style dutch style roundabout uh, within that same space that's that's not the concern at all at that stage anymore no yeah. for sure yeah yeah it's good stuff i wish more i wish more cities would do it <laughs> yes and uh, they're working on it in in in, uh, in a few places uh, the uk has recently uh, built their first uh, European or Dutch style roundabout yes. with bike priority. Yes, yes. Um, and it's going well. Uh, it's always a bit scary, right? Because you you, you put bikes, uh, you give uh, bikes give uh, get priority, so cars have to stop for them, and you know there's all all these different things that happen. So it does take a bit of training and a bit of getting used to, but it does work. And even in a, in an English or UK context, which is not necessarily the most bicycle friendly context, it, it, it can operate quite well. So it's uh, yeah. It's a bit of bravery, I think, uh, that it takes to yeah, build the yeah. first one. Yeah, I, I would agree too. And it's it, for me um, that first time of of uh, traveling to the Netherlands and uh, experiencing the Dutch style roundabouts. Um, I went there anticipating it, and so I sought it out. And but it would just it, it you it, you. It's hard to explain just how amazing it is to to experience it and ride it and yeah. go oh yeah this is just so intuitive it makes so much sense and yeah. um to your point if a motor vehicle driver is required to to wait ultimately the the, the waiting times are are are, are quite minimal you know they yeah. you know yeah. it's unless they happen to be in a situation where the the bike and pedestrian numbers are so extreme mm. to which you know there would then be a, a huge queuing up of of motor mm. vehicles and maybe that's not the right treatment for that particular area um i don't know but the the point my point is is that it it works quite well and there's this, a certain amount of uh, forcing people to make eye contact and communicate mm. and and be able to navigate in that environment. Yeah. And since all the speeds are incredibly slow and low, mm. it, it just it, it works incredibly well. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, speed, speed is everything, right? And and I think the way uh, traditionally we design intersections is we don't want to slow down the cars too much. You might put a, a traffic light in, but you still have, if it's green, you can travel through that intersection at full speed. And that's kind of counter productive because the whole purpose of an intersection is to slow down because that's where conflicting movements come together. And if they come together, you don't want to have them crash at a very high speed because that's dangerous. Um, so so managing the speed and, and not being scared of really reducing the speed at the intersection, irrespective of whether you put in a roundabout or traffic lights, even at a traffic light, you should slow the cars down. Um, that, that's, I think, a very under underutilized tool in the, in, in the safety toolbox. Um, and like you said, the, the 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 roundabout works very efficiently. I mean, the, the, the Dutch are nothing if not efficient. We we don't like waste, uh, and that's why we consider traffic lights are, are often quite wasteful in terms of capacity or time. Right? There's clearance time. You have to accelerate. You have to come to a full stop. All of those things are wasted energy, wasted time, or wasted capacity. Right. Um, and with a roundabout, you don't have that because it's a self-managing system. If it's right. quiet, you just flow through at a low speed, but continuous. Um, so there's often much less delay at the roundabout than an intersection if you if you count up the whole. Right. So the other the other aspect of self-managing systems are you know sort of the the unsung hero as i like to call them <laughs> of the the dutch network and, and that is the the slower streets that are out yeah. there i mean it, it's the protected infrastructure and the separated infrastructure yeah, and yeah. the the fancy yeah. intersection designs that get all the press but in re, in reality a fairly significant amount of the network yeah. is in fact you know, some form of shared space, some form of slow street design. So let me pull up um, the, the this particular uh, image here. And, and, and this is part of a, a recent um, a webinar that you did. And you, you're talking a little bit about width here. So I'm going to actually turn the yeah. volume up and we can listen to it. Uh, just a little bit, and uh, and then I'll turn the volume back down, and you can talk a little bit more live about this. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Uh, width, width is everything. Uh, if your street is wide, you'll you'll get a gun barrel effect, and people will will just focus on the the horizon, and thus speed up. Um, so making sure that the traffic psychology works for the for the drivers a um, few examples this is a one from Haarlem in, in the Netherlands where they've really shrunk down the, the the street to two meters wide which makes it actually quite hard for a Tesla to get through nowadays because their cars tend to get wider um, but you shouldn't build your your infrastructure accordingly um, but as soon as people feel that the space is too narrow for the, for their vehicle the first thing they do is, is slow down um, and while you can do that from the outset, if you have a new development like a greenfield development or a new street, a full street rebuild, you can take that into account, but it can also be retrofitted, as you can see in this example. Um, but you can use different methods and tools. Obviously. There it is. There's our famous rock. <laughs> I, well, I, sneaks I, into fell over, I fell over laughing uh, when I watched this live uh, and, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> A retrofitted traffic calming feature, yeah. Yeah, accidentally yeah. retrofitted, I guess. <laughs> but I, that brings up a really interesting point, though, is that as drivers, there's a certain mentality that if we are slowed down um, by something, you know, if we're slowed down by a rock, a big rock, we don't get too out bent out of shape. If we get slowed down by, you know, if it's like in a rural setting, we get slowed down by a farmer trying to get to a location with, you know, maybe a horse or two or, or you know, a, a, a tractor and a, and, and, a, and a wagon or something. We don't get too worked up. But when it comes to, um, when it comes to, you know, people getting in our way, <laughs> you know, whether it's pedestrians or, or people on bikes, the temperature rises and, and, mm -hmm. and, and we get very, very impatient. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an, a, and, and I'll say this, this is, not just an Amer North American yeah. thing. I'm sure you experienced this in, in other countries. You said you were in, in New Zealand for a fair amount of time. You probably saw it there too. I see it a little bit in the Netherlands, but nowhere near as much. 
Yeah, no, but that's, I think that's part, partially because we designed it out of the system, right? We, we have separated bikeways because we want to keep the bikes separate so they don't um, annoy the cars. Like that's a really, <laughs> that's a really bad thing to say, I guess. But um, the goal of, uh, the, or the reason why we have separated bikeways is because we have a lot of cars and we want to accommodate the cars. If we didn't have so many cars, we didn't need separated bikeways. There's not some fundamental underlying political system that we're like, we want separated bikeways. No, they're, they're just a function of uh, introducing a lot of cars into the mix. Um, so while that, the outcome is great, there's no, no necess not necessarily an underlying factor that's very different here. They, they, Dutch drivers get really annoyed if there's a bike on the road that goes really slow, unless you've designed it in such a way that that either doesn't happen very often, or it's designed in such a way where the bike has primacy and, and is uh, where the car feels as, a, as, a, as, as though they're a guest. So in a bicycle street, you'll see a little bit less of that. But that's all, that's all, that's all psychology, right? right? Traffic engineering is is 90% psychology and 10% engineering. The engineering is easy. Right. It's there's standards, there's guidelines, everybody, you can buy or you can call a contractor and say, Re repave this road for me, and they'll do it because they've done 100 of them before, no problem at all. But the, the, the tricky bit is trying to get the psychology to work. So Drivers don't drive too fast. So drivers don't uh, try and hit bikes on their way. You know, you take that aggression out, take that focus on the other. Like you said, I think that's a really nice way to put it. As soon as there's other people involved, we get annoyed. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's just a strange human <laughs> human nature um, thing. But that, that means that you have to design a traffic system that works with that and not against that. And that's why I think shadows are such a stupid thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and let's go back over to our, our video here and, uh, and press play and, and, and look at this. Uh, so talk about design. You know, again, paint is not enough. Walk us through what no. you're talking about here. Yeah, this, this, like, this is purely psychological as well. It's, it's when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you're driving and you, you have to, if you're really active or you're really conscious of where you're looking or what you're looking at, um, if you if your street is designed in a very linear way with with long lines or, or um, paint, um, you're always drawn to the horizon, to the the, the dot on the horizon. Um, same with intersections, where you have the traffic light on the other side of the intersection. Um, if if you paid attention on the on the um, the Canmore intersection, the traffic lights are actually at the stop line and not on the other side. It's, I think ah, the first okay. intersection in in uh, North America that has that. But that's it's a small detail. It may sound like a small detail, but it's hugely important because if you think about it, if I'm looking for the light, I'm having my eyes like laser focus on that light, waiting for it to turn green. But if you put the light further or closer to the to the stop line, you have to look towards the left and the right and who's on the left and the right that's where the bikes and the pedestrians are and that's right. where they're coming from right. so you're 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 playing with people's vision to make sure that they're looking in the right direction and and that's i think a, a different attitude we're trying to make it easy for people to be safe you know you don't you don't want to force people to feel safe you want to make it normal and easy for them to to do that right um, yeah yeah if you if you if you're a, a pedestrian waiting to cross you're already within the line of sight of that right. driver turning right because right. they're in the same field of vision yeah yeah it's the mm. details it's it's a lot of details yeah, yeah. you gotta get the <laughs> details right you know it's yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And it doesn't mean that you you can't make huge improvements without getting all of the details right. I mean, it's a long struggle. Oh yeah. Uh, perfection is the enemy of the good, and I think there's there's been, you know, tons of protected intersections built that if we look at it from a Dutch lens, we're like, mm, you know, details are not quite right. Right. Um, right. But they're still they have been hugely important in getting the message across, getting people to think about it and experimenting with their own way. Because right. at the end of the day, you can't just copy the Dutch. You have to find the North American answer to the, the same challenges. And I think that's that's right. the point where we're getting to now. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and one of the things, it's been a reoccurring theme that, that I've talked about um, in, 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 in sort of highlighting the Dutch network system is, mm -hmm. is also the fact that y'all are constantly testing and, and trialing and piloting and looking at stuff and putting stuff out there and going, it's just not working quite well or it worked well at a certain volume and now it's it, it's being overwhelmed yeah. and so we have to redo this and so that's one of the great things that 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 i try to um emphasize and try to talk about is just how incredibly 
open to continuous improvement. Mm. Um, you know, the Dutch system really yeah. is. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's I think that's a big uh, that's a big difference. That's I think partially. Um, there's big differences within the Netherlands, right? I mean, the, the situation in Amsterdam and Utrecht, uh, where there's huge numbers of, of cyclists like crazy. Um, they're off the charts, literally. So they had to figure it out for themselves. Um, and they, they follow the same guidelines that every other town and city in the Netherlands follows. Uh, but they are guidelines. And they're, they're, they're lit the first, the CRW book, if the, the, some of the more avid um, bicycle planners and designers will maybe have a copy in their in their shelf. On the first page, it says this is a guideline, and we uh, you are required to use your sound engineering knowledge um, to use and apply these guidelines in a in a good way. So there's no such thing as a standard. You're not going to be um, held accountable if you don't meet the standard and something happens. You know that's a it's yeah. a very different culture of of engineering and and designing, and that's you know that's we're not going to change it overnight in the in the US but um that that's that does help uh, fostering that that innovative um, aspect of, of traffic engineering which it, it does yeah it, there's quite a lot of innovation happening now though in the last well probably the 20 years before this not mm -hmm. so much because you know the system we had was working quite nicely right the separated bikeways weren't overwhelmed um but currently here and in utrecht i mean thirty-five thousand bikes a day on the street like we don't have a, a guideline for that <laughs> so they have to figure it out they're just like well, i don't know maybe right. maybe make it wider okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 the That's the funny. other there was that one intersection in there in amsterdam where uh the queuing that was happening from the number of cyclists, you know, at that particular uh, light, and mm. and they they went back and looked at it, especially from above, and we're like, you know what? If we bulb this out in this area, we could get you know X number more to be, able, you know, it's just yeah, like yeah. thinking through, thinking thinking yeah. differently, taking that opportunity to to not be so steadfastly mm. um, married to, you know the MUTCD the manual, standard. you know, yeah. the standard yeah, yeah. or this or that. Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I do have a copy of my Crow manual and I love, <laughs> you know, going through yeah. there and taking a look at stuff. And, yeah. and, uh, it, it's truly fascinating. Now you had mentioned we, or we, we both mentioned the details are, are, are critical. So let's yeah. pull up this next slide. So, because this is part of that, uh, that, uh, webinar that you were doing and designing streets and the de devil is, in the details and I'll turn the mm. volume back up for just a little bit and we'll listen to this here. Right. And some of those details are in the, in the paving styles, for example, this is a road um, just around the corner from the, from our side visit, um, which you can see has two different types of bricks um, laid. So it's, they're both bricks and bricks are the, the key um, ingredient that we use in Dutch streets to indicate a 30 kilometer per hour zone. Not necessarily the only way to do that, but it does uh, slow down cars pretty effectively and efficiently. I'm going to pause this here just just for a second. Talk a little bit about this this particular street design. What mm. what, what what is this street called, and why is it designed the way that it is? Yeah, so this is the the single, the weird single around the the old city center of Utrecht. So it goes, it's a full loop around mm -hmm. the canal uh, belt, a former defense um, uh, line basically of the city, and now it's uh, well. There's, there's multiple aspects. It's an old street, right? You can see old houses. It's been here for, for ages and it was always, or the last few decades has been in, in, in red bricks. Mm -hmm. um, the city really wants to turn it into a bit of a bicycle ring to um, to take some of the pressure off the city center and, and allow for uh, more bicycles to, to go around the city instead of through the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and this this part of the, the street is actually resisting um, <laughs> turning it into uh, asphalt bike lanes with a brick center, which is mm. the treatment that they've used further down because they like the heritage value of the the bricks right. um what but what you can see in the bricks is that the the ones in the middle they're quite um bumpy and rough and big gaps in between and the ones on the, on the where the bikes uh, go are quite a bit smaller more tightly uh, laid so much smoother experience which is right. yeah it's it's like, you know, if you would design or if you don't look at this very carefully, you think like, oh, yeah, brick road, fine. Uh, we'll, we'll do that. We'll copy the Dutch and we'll make a brick road and it'll be 30 and everybody will love it. And then you get outrage from the, the, the people on bikes who are like, oh, that's not comfortable. We can't ride there. Right. And right. 
the, the Dutch figured it out. And we're like, well, we, we can have best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it is a relatively smooth experience, to be fair. Right. It's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And I think you actually end up talking about that here in just a moment of, you know what it what it feels like you know, from a traffic mm. calming perspective and also that yeah. difference between the sensation that you get from as a motor vehicle driver versus a you know somebody who's mm. riding a bike obviously if you're riding a bike you don't want to be on rough cobbles <laughs> you know you no. prefer the smoother side so let's let's t- take a listen to this a little bit more two different types and that's done to alleviate some of the um, the rumbling for for bikes so on the right hand side a, a different type of brick a different type different style of laying the bricks which gives uh, provides a much smoother surface so an easier bike ride for the the, the precious Utrecht cyclist <laughs> um, and on the left hand side a more rough more rounded edge brick um, spaced apart a little bit further also gives you maybe a little bit more infiltration of rainwater um, but that's done for the cars uh, because you want them to have the friction and to have that tactile feedback mm. when they drive too fast. Um, and that's the level of detail that I think you don't see much in, um, in other mm. countries. Well, I haven't seen it that much yet. I'll let this roll into... Increase the noise within the car as well. So yep. not only is it that friction and the rumbling, but the mm. louder it seems in the car, the faster psychologically you feel yep. you're moving. And so it forces people to slow down. Exactly. That's interesting too. Uh, you know, Melissa's talking a little bit here about the noise and that that feedback system mm. that happens within the for the driver, um, but it also you know, and, and she and Chris you know had an entire chapter about the noise levels in cities. It also creates a a noise factor for the ambient environment too, and so I, I think that I get the historic like and love for the brick in in that type of setting, but then again, if the if the it's it's a trade-off right because if the motor vehicle numbers are such that it's you know hey i've got super insulated comfy ride here and you know whatever i'm gonna blow through here it i mean i wonder you know if there's that trade-off of the the tire noise you know and over the cobbles that you know sort of has a negative impact negative yeah. externalities on the on the you know the residents in that area yeah and it, it's a very complicated trade-off because uh, with asphalt if you take into account the higher speed of cars on asphalt that mm-hmm. that actually negates some of the effect mm-hmm. um, but now with electric cars mm-hmm. at 30 they don't make a lot of noise themselves right um, so then the, the the noise from the wheels on the bricks is actually um, louder than the noise right. from the the engine um, so then it becomes a whole different dynamic so yeah that's it's a very complicated uh, discussion um, but in in general the the noise uh, there's not necessarily a lot more noise from brick streets because the speed comes down uh, got a it. lot got it so it that's comes a, down there, a lot. yeah there's yeah. there's a double a double trade-off going on it right right it's, a, it's yeah it's complicated yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, if we let this video run just a little bit, I, I think I saw a little advance of, of some traffic calming <laughs> devices. Yeah, uh, is, yeah. is that worth, uh, you know, talking a little bit about? On it's a little bit technical, street? I guess. Is a little it? bit technical. But... Okay, well, let's do it. Let's do it then, because <laughs> yeah. apparently my audience loves technical stuff. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let this go. Mm-hmm. And a little bit of engineering to, yeah. make, to get it right. Yeah, perfect. Um. And then uh, in terms of detailing um, speed tables, they're obviously an important ingredient and you'll see some of them in the, in the, in the footage as well. But the type of, of, of speed table that you use can be quite uh, important and quite a, a tricky balance to get right. On the one hand, you want cars to slow down, but on the other hand, you also want to provide um, for a pretty smooth transition for, for bikes, for example. And you don't want to have um, emergency services saying no to the whole scheme because the, the, the ramp to the, the speed table is too steep. So finding the right type, and there's a, a plethora of types of speed tables with different angles and different materials, is uh, crucial to getting the, the speed and the comfort balance uh, correctly. Yeah, so these are the four, the four principles. I'll hit pause on that uh, at, at that point. Um, I appreciate that because oftentimes, you know, that's what neighborhoods, you know, sort of default and go to. And so it's like, oh, let's put speed bumps in or, or you know, and it's just like, uh, that's kind of like you're missing the point a little bit. Yeah. So I, I appreciate yeah. that. The speed tables are funny because they, they, they should be the last resort. 
Um, mm-hmm. in, if you design a street well, you don't need speed tables or not that many, maybe at the intersections to highlight the, 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 the intersection and the you know, other directions and the equality of the intersection or priority. So we don't like to use them as a first port of call, but then they're so effective. <laughs> they just work so well. Um, so it's nobody likes them, but they do work well and they're just there. They You build them once and they just stay there. So they, I understand where, why people like them and why people refer to them so so quickly. But getting them right is, is then the next step, right? If you, if you have a, a really particular um, fire department that that really doesn't like them and you you compromise on the type of t- speed table for example then the whole thing is, is is useless pretty quickly because people just blast over them and then you've spent all that money went through all of that public consultation and you got an ineffective speed table so that's you know that, that's a really a, a risky game to put all of your eggs in that in that um, basket of the, the speed table yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm going to pull up this this image here uh, just just to talk a little bit about um, the speed table concept. And uh, it, this isn't isn't the best photo to, to to use this, but talking about the continuous um, walkway, the continuous bikeway concept when you're at some of the more minor roadway situations mm. so that you continue that elevation and this and, and one of the things that that we see that i notice on many of the well-designed uh, dutch roundabout systems is that you have that elevated uh situation at the you know it, it essentially becomes that speed table it becomes that elevated crossing yeah. for the more vulnerable users and then you know that really sends a a, a a definitive message to the motor vehicle drivers. Mm. Obviously, we don't have that in this context. Uh, that would have been a much more expensive <laughs> rebuild to the to the yeah. entire yeah. thing. But um, talk a little bit about that because I think that's that's a pretty. It, it is a little bit wonky yeah. and it is a little bit you know yeah. of a engineering thing. But going back to the psychology of how the design matters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love those little features. And a, a lot of Dutch people wouldn't even know what I'm talking about if I if I talk about it. But mm-hmm. like the fact that we allow, like on, a, on an arterial street, right? A busy mm-hmm. arterial road, clearly the priority for, for all the cars. Yet we allow all of these little side streets to just have unfettered access to and from this main arterial, which is where the flow of vehicles is so important. Mm-hmm. Yet we give so much access from these side roads without them even, you know, noticing that they're, transitioning because it's a flat asphalt surface and they just they just get to go and yeah, there's a little yeah. sign that says yield but nothing else yeah so like you said the, the messaging um and not relying on signage but to to make it uh you know make them feel that they're transitioning into a different space on those type of, of treatments is so important um when you when you're turning off an arterial into a little side street that you know that you're crossing first into the pedestrian or the bicycle space uh, and you're now you know then it makes so much sense to give way because you have quite a you know if you have to slow down significantly you have to take a tight turn and they're like oh i'm going up and it looks like a footpath why am i in a footpath oh maybe i should give way to these people crossing you know that, that all makes so much more sense than when you just have well an unmarked crosswalk, which I still find baffling, um, but uh, any other uh, paint or signage is not going to give you the same immediately uh, immediate sensation of like, oh, I'm in a different environment now. And um, at roundabouts in particular, like if you have priority uh, as a bike or a pedestrian, then it takes away a lot of the um, accessibility issues. Um, you can you have clear, continuous uh, footway. It's super comfortable if you're walking with a pram or with a wheelchair or any rolling device. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a super clear message to all of the drivers approaching like, oh, yeah, I'm bumping up, which means I give way to these guys because I'm in their space now. And that's a... Uh, yeah, the messaging again it's 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 not engineering it's it's psychology because you're like oh i'm i'm invited into another space it's not black asphalt so it's not my space right 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 and i really appreciate that i mean I, my career um i, I spent the <laughs> the first two-thirds of my career really focusing on human behavior and healthcare behavior health promotion mm-hmm. designing mm-hmm. systems that encourage people to to live a healthier you know, life and you know, about 10, 15 years ago got turned on to urban design and transportation design mm-hmm. and how 
what we design out in our communities has an impact on our behavior and our ability to live a healthy, active lifestyle. And so that's right back on that psychology, you know, thing as well. It's it's, that that connection. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That design. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Making sure that the system allows for people to make it feel normal the way they're they're behaving and that 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 behavior suits the behavior that's legally required or expected of them like right. the, the 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 speed 20 20 mile or 15 mile or five mile speed zone mm -hmm. if it's a four lane arterial with uh, traffic lights and the whole thing is like what are you messaging to me you you have this little yellow sign that says 20 yet the whole road design screams 50 at me like that's and then right. i i don't even blame drivers from for speeding because it's like yeah well that makes sense like you don't see half of the signs like i think about 60 or 70 percent of the signs along the road you don't see them right. because you don't have time and you shouldn't be focused on the signs <laughs> right yeah. you should be focused on other people yeah um, yeah and making sure that the system communicates that and the system uh, allows for good behavior and rewards good behavior in that sense is such a, a nicer way of traveling than than being hammered with speeding tickets all the time <laughs> right yeah 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 exactly so I, I appreciate what you mean what you were saying there too about uh you know the design and and how as a driver if what you see in front of you is just so incredibly wide it, it harkens back to that photo that that was in the the video there where you know paint's not enough that's one of the reasons why mm. paint didn't <laughs> didn't work in that particular area is too is you just looked at it it's a wide open tarmac of it really doesn't feel narrower yes you narrowed the lane but you used mm. a whole bunch of paint you know and and it just yeah, yeah. It, it from a driver's perspective it still seemed like a wide open place where speeding was was encouraged and, and is yeah. okay go ahead yeah. speed so, yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it's like the the whole you know cyclist versus driver thing and mm -hmm. it's like we're taking away space from drivers well actually we're making it much nicer for people in cars because right. they don't have to worry about killing somebody i mean that's a huge change if, if you make a separated car lane mm -hmm. like separated so you make a separated bike lane but actually you're creating a separated car lane right where you give them their own space they don't have to worry about about killing another human being i mean right. that's that's a gift <laughs> <laughs> and that's if you change the conversation to look we're taking this hazard away from your precious vehicles that's good. It, it improves the flow. It improves the safety, and you have less mental load to worry about in this urban environment. Yeah, yeah. that's 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 nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's why that's why the TomTom Tom driver happiness index right rates the Dutch mm -hmm. system the highest for right. car drivers. Right. The highest rated car driver system in the world because we took away all those bikes. They have their own space. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And the entire system is is safer for everyone. It's safer for for, for people yep. driving. It's safer for people who are walking. It's safer for people who are on bikes. It's safer for um, people who have physical challenges, physical disabilities, and uh, you know, it, and it's too often that is missed in the in, in the conversation, especially here in North America, when there's an assumption that somebody who, you know, maybe in a wheelchair or some other assisted device, uh, you know, that the bike lane is not for them. And I think the Netherlands mm. does a really, really good job because you mentioned it earlier too, about when you have that continuous elevation across some of those uh, more minor side streets, it, it was, you had mentioned it, it's better for, you know, parents pushing the prams, you know, the strollers, as well as someone who's in a, a mobility device or wheelchair, so. Yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. Time. There's a um, we just released last week a webinar on on this particular topic where we follow somebody in a, a scoot mobile, so an assisted, mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, four wheeler um, um, electric wheelchair, I guess you could call it. Um, and you see them using the using the space, using the city, using the bike lanes, and they're like, yeah, the bike lanes are great. They're smooth. They're separated. They're safe. Um, and treating they're not treated as a pedestrian uh, they can well they can be a pedestrian or they can be a bike whatever suits the environment and they're fully independent in this uh, in, in in the city because yeah. of the bike network yeah yeah there you go yeah. and here it is this is out on uh, your youtube uh, page for mobicon and yes there you go and there's maya um that uh, was also yeah. featured in in chris and melissa's uh, fabulous book yeah. curbing traffic uh so folks 
you know, please head on over, subscribe to the MobyCon uh, channel uh, on YouTube there. And uh, it, it's part of this whole series of what they call the MobyCon Academy. Y'all had really kind of dug in and, and, and launched the, the Academy during the, the, the height of the lockdown and the pandemic. Um, and, and I know that you're continuing to produce content and get it out there. Uh, not as frequently as before, but you're also, it's available for free now. So everybody, yeah. you know, please yeah. tune in. Yeah. I, and that's, you know, I've been working on it for a long time, so I like yeah. it. <laughs> um, but I, I think it, it has some really, uh, valuable lessons like that, that capacity building for, for designing, for, for cycling and pedestrian and, you know, active transportation, like you said, the devil is in the details and that's, that just takes a lot of. Um, you know, experience, but also just a lot of uh, knowledge to 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 gather. It's not the same as traffic engineering for cars. It's it's right. a very different game, um, and making sure you know as much as you can before you start venturing and, and designing yeah. uh, separated cycleways or new transportation networks. Yeah, knowledge is power. Knowledge is <laughs> so power. that's why we that's yeah. why we're doing it. <laughs> Fantastic. Are there any final thoughts? Any any anything that we didn't cover that you you think is really important that we leave the audience with here today? Um, I think there's a, uh, especially for the US, well, from an outsider's perspe perspective, there's a lot of momentum and uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm and there's a lot of uh, funding coming in. Um, and I think, um, well, my hope is that it will, will be money well spent, but I'm, I'm sure some of it is not going to be well spent, but that's also fine. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think the, 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 the trick is now in the, in the delivery or the, the devil is in the, in the details and, and the details of delivery. So I'm really hoping that, that um, North American cities will maintain their momentum and, and not compromise too much on their uh, designs in the, in the next batch of uh, infrastructure or separated cycleways or whatever or roundabouts whatever you're designing um because it's really valuable to have some really high quality examples that that are north american examples that that can be used and copied across uh, the, the the country and, and now is the, t the right time to to be building those and um start moving away from the flexi posts and the and the, and the little bollards and the orcas and whatnot and start creating more permanent infrastructure that's not just functional but also looks beautiful so that would be my my final thought don't compromise too much make beautiful streets and people will start loving those cycleways fantastic leonard this has been such uh, an absolute joy having you uh, on to to chat about all this stuff thank you so much for joining me on the active towns podcast thanks for having me it was a joy Thank you so much for watching episode number 104 featuring Leonard Nout with MobyCon. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button, leave me a comment, share it with a friend, subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notifications bell. And yes, if you really appreciate what I'm trying to accomplish here with the Active Towns channel, please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page or making a donation to the Active Towns organization as we strive to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. To learn more about the concepts that we discussed in this episode, please be sure to check out the links in the video description below or in the show notes. Well, that's all for this week's episode. Thank you all so very much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers, and Happy New Year.